Today we're going to talk about scale out block storage and how Amazon does it and how to do a scale out block storage design. I'm Eric Windish. I'm a principal engineer at cloud scaling and a lead on OpenStack development. I'm a OpenStack developer since Cactus. I've been doing platform as a service since 2002, Inf infrastructure as a service since 2006, and I've done engineering for KT. We're gonna start with Amazon's architecture, or at least what we can infer, what we know about it. Most of this information we've gotten off of the disclosures on failures that have happened and the analysis that people have done on it. So you have a control plane and storage. They're separate. They're loosely coupled. So you can lose a control plane or the storage and not both. Although in practice, they've actually lost the storage and then realized that the control plane trying to control a broken storage can kind of uh, fail on them sometimes. So they would sometimes have to also shut down the control plane when they've had failures. And then EC2 connects back into that storage. They use distributed storage, and it's not entirely clear if it's an actual DHT, but you could have a distributed uh, network like this. And by being distributed, there are certain guarantees that you can or cannot have in a distributed system. There's this thing called Brewer's theorem. It's also called the CAP theorem which says, states that it is impossible for a distributed system to simultaneously provide all three of the following guarantees, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So Amazon, by doing this, by having a distributed system, through whatever mechanism their system is distributed, if it is truly distributed, then you can only get two of these three. And that means that for storage, block storage, I mean, you have to have consistency. That, that's clear. This is a problem. You absolutely have to have consistency, which means you have to decide to have availability or partition tolerance. Both of those affect your reliability, which means that in a, block, a distributed block storage system, you cannot have reliability. It's impossible. Well, unless somebody disproves Brewer's theorem, anyway. And you can kind of fake having these other things. So you can get two of these three and kind of fake the third one. But you can't be guaranteed of the third one. So because EBS doesn't have reliability, users of EBS have to presume that doesn't exist. People use snapshots. Amazon provides the ability to provide snapshots against their EBS as a form of reliability. And the only way to get that reliability is to use them. So cloud failures, they happen. They have happened. Amazon's had these problems occur already. Reddit posting about how Reddit went down from EBS failure. Other people, uh, Imager, other cloud providers. Uh, I don't know if Netflix went down or not, but plenty of people did. So what really happened? You can read all this stuff, but the reality is stuff happened. <laughs> I toned that down, by the way. <laughs> Service providers fail. Uh, hardware does fail, but Operators fail and software fails more often than the other things. So the Amazon failures, somebody put a bad DNS record in one time, and another one of the major uh, EC2 failures was a bad router config that was accidentally uploaded. Th those were the longest Amazon outages, actually. I, I think one of them was something like 24 hours and for, for some affected customers or in, in zones. Yeah. And well, we, we actually took out names for these particular outages, but you have 24 hours and 72 hours uh, for some of these. And people make mistakes, right? People make that software and the software has bugs or operators put in bad configs. So quickly just going to scale out because we're going to talk about scale up quite a bit in this talk. You want to make box 
instead of make, scaling up and making boxes bigger, you want to scale out and make more boxes. You don't want pets and dogs, you want cattle. You don't want, you just want to, if you have a problem with one of your cows, you shoot it, you don't treat it nicely like your dog and, you know, pet it and feed it nicely. Right. Be, be, because again, we, we don't have reliability. Like we already know, th according to the computer science theory, we cannot have reliability, so we, we can't treat our, our things like pets. We have to presume that they're just going to die. And we need to have small failure domains and not big failure domains. We can't have everything fail all at once because it will fail. So the Cinder architecture, somewhat at the high level from the 50 foot perspective, it kind of looks a little bit like Amazon. You have a control plane, it's loosely coupled to the storage, and your compute nodes, your, what would be EC2, or in this case, Nova Compute, talks to your storage. We have a control plane, and all these pieces here are scale out. It's designed for scale out. But then what we do in the bottom is we plug in to different block storage solutions. And in Cinder, this, well, in Cinder, we have these mostly controlled by various vendors. And we have 18 different architectures in which you can actually deploy Cinder. So Cinder isn't a solution. Cinder is 18 different architectures and 18 different solutions. And really, it really comes down to all these really provide one of these three things. NAS, backends, distributed file systems, and that's actually a little thing of Ceph there. And block storage, generally SAN, iSCSI, uh, fiber channel over Ethernet or regular fiber channel, for instance. So before I talk about the, the storage backends in more depth, I really want to just talk briefly about this, the control plane because it has implications for which storage plugin that you choose and how you do your storage backend. And not all the plugins may actually work with a scale out control plane, it turns out, or at least not a highly scale out control plane. So here we have a scale up, scale up pattern. I, I hope nobody does this. This is, you have a really big server controlling a really big storage system in the back end. And you can lose your really big, either of your really big servers. So something that was introduced in Grizzly was this idea of a multi back end pattern where you can get your really big control plane or several multi-big control planes to control several really big storage systems. That they said, well, we're gonna, we, we realize that we can't have this one really big storage system here. So we're going to add multiple really big storage systems and manage them through Cinder. And we're going to just have this one box that can orchestrate these. And then we can make multiple of these boxes that control multiple of these big giant storage systems. And it becomes very expensive, first of all, because many, most of these storage systems are expensive systems. Uh, not always. And you limit your ability to scale because now you have six of these storage systems and three of the control plane nodes. And to prevent one of your control plane nodes going out and to actually scale up that control plane node and get additional reliability, you have to make it very complex. You get split brain problems if you actually try and control one storage node from one machine and then the other storage, it just becomes nasty. You pretty much can't, it's, it's a very hard problem to solve. And Cinder doesn't actually do this. So, to really do the scale-out pattern, it, you can't even do it with a Cinder at all. And uh, to fix this, we're going to have to talk a little bit more about the storage backend. And we're going to break it. Or we're going to show how it fails and it breaks. So 
scale out, scale out, right? This is what we just showed. So I guess just to jump a little bit, right? So to do that pattern we were just showing a couple few slides ago was really a scale out then scale up pattern because even if you even if you scale the control plane, those are still really big backend storage boxes that you're controlling that some vendor provided you. So you can get a failed storage backend, transport failures, failed servers, and now your front end box has to be aware of that and understand that, and stuff goes down. And most people try and fix this through doing HA pairs. And when you do, when you talk to an HA pair, you're talking not to a system. You're not talking to the active system in that pair. You're talking to the HA pair. You're talking to the HA system. Because the HA system itself, first of all, can fail. Uh, Randy, Bias, and myself have both given talks about how this design is generally broken because the pacemaker or whatever system that you use to actually provide this failover fails more often than the actual machines in which it's trying to protect from failing over. <laughs> <laughs> and we have lots of in-depth analysis and discussion about that on our blog and uh, some of the other slide decks that we've prepared that are linked there. So just to give more depth on how bad this is, it's really complex. You don't necessarily know where your data is because it, you may get inconsistency between these HA pair nodes. You get more split brain problems because not only have split brain problems between the cinder volume agents and the storage backend, but then you get split brain problems between the different HA nodes. And cinder still doesn't support this. <laughs> so this adds network complexity. And this is just to get high availability for one of those for one of those backends. You have to do this for each of those backends. This is what somebody told me is a NetApp uh, system. I haven't verified that, but I've been told. So going back to Brewer's theorem, when you do HA, you decide to actually have really high availability and get reliability. You get that through partition tolerance and availability, which means you actually give up on consistency. And that's why you get these split brain problems. You know, you, you trade up consistency. And that's actually really, really important for storage. And it's really scary <laughs> that people decide to give that up. So we have a solution, or what we recommend that people do. And that we do Cinder like we do Nova. In Nova, you have some way of doing high availability for your API, and that can be HTTP proxy. It doesn't have to be. Um, I generally th say that there's a single point of entry. You can use LVS or um, any cast or whatever, uh, ECMP, uh, to API servers, into schedulers. And in Nova, those are compute nodes. And in Cinder, those are volume services. So Cinder's designed like this now. It scales out. You just have to deploy in a way that you actually leverage this, as opposed to designing where you cannot leverage this. And because all these machines are communicating point to point, it is important that we actually communicate point to point. So at least at cloud scaling, we've been deploying with 0MQ, which is a distributed broker. And the way that RabbitMQ is used in OpenStack at present is through a completely centralized broker. And by doing that, you introduce points of failure that machines can fail to communicate to each other because they fail to communicate the rabbit because messages go through rabbits. So we have the machines talk directly to each other so that this pattern is actually direct communication between these nodes. So we scale things together. We put our storage with the, with this, with, with the Cinder volume. So it is more tightly coupled to the control plane slightly, uh, but only to the extent that the Cinder volume service is attached to the hip at the storage in which it's controlling. This is simple. 
it's deterministic. We're not going to lose all of our data, right? We're, so if you have a distributed file system, if you had some major bug in your architecture, you could lose all your data or you could have problems that, well, I just don't want to get into, but um, we, we just can't lose all of our data here because we're going to lose a box. We're not going to lose everything. And even though these leaf node systems can lose data, it's not really important because we already assume that there's no reliability in our application and in our use of this backend. And we use snapshots to hedge against it, which is what everybody does on Amazon already anyway and what everybody using cloud uh, is or should be doing. And we decide that consistency and partition tolerance are more important than anything. They're more important than availability. Because if it goes down, we just restore from a snapshot. And that's how snapshots save us, and we just don't really care if we ever lose a node. So, um, actually that was a lot of slides and I went, maybe I went too quickly. Uh, we have plenty of time for Q&A. <laughs> uh, we also have a blog. Uh, that's where you will be able to download this link and hopefully if this presentation was recorded, you'll be able to view it again as well and point people to it. Uh, I'd like to open the floor for questions. So the question was, how do you mitigate against the impact of doing snapshots, like frequent snapshots? Well, people are going to use snapshots anyway. If you're doing an EBS style solution and you're providing a block storage like this and people are approaching it from the perspective that they're using Amazon today, then they're already going to be doing this. So no matter what your architecture is, if you use one really big backend storage box, you are going to already have customers doing just the same number of snapshots as they would be doing with this. It's just that maybe you're not designing for it. So you, you have to design for it regardless. So with this design, so Actually, so one way that our design differs from Amazon's is that because we're not actually using a distributed file system, it's actually really, really fast. So, and all the machines, it's uh, essentially direct attached storage um, at, at the far end of it, and it's really fast. So you, we, we can do reads and random reads uh, incredibly quickly. We're using ZFS with uh, L2ARC and uh, and dedicate Zold devices. So we essentially have hybrid SSD slash uh, hard disk storage. It's really, really fast. So this solution is uh, fast enough to do all the snapshots that you would need. And in fact, we've run into more problems with actually getting performance out of the software that does snapshots than the actual storage solution itself. We actually, it's really hard to make the software fast enough, especially if you're using something like Python, to actually make it fast enough to do the snapshots. Over there. Thank you. Sure. So if you've got no particular comfortable memory and this is your dedication, you try to store it on the same node, are you seeing resource constraints that you play out that way? So, so, so storage is not on the same nodes. So the question was how we re deal with resource contention. I believe you're saying with uh, this being on the same nodes as the compute. And this is scale out in parallel to the, to the compute node. So, there are dedicated storage nodes and compute connects into that but is not bundled with compute. Okay, you're not storing Over here. If you only if you only have you only keep one copy of the data, is that right? Yes. And so how do you handle like downtime and upgrades? Uh, you know, you need to take on a storage node to upgrade to something. So how do we deal with upgrades if we have it kind of tied at the hip? Uh, well First of all, we 
try and avoid upgrades if, if we can. Um, <laughs> so, no, so, we're actually, so you can upgrade the control plane pretty painlessly without affecting the backend storage. If you have to really update the backend storage, then you could bring a node down and back up and through proper management of timeouts and the configuration of, you know, we're using iSCSI uh, for our transport. If you configure it correctly, it can actually survive a, a fairly quick reboot uh, if you had to do so. Uh, but the reality is we can actually do most of our upgrades uh, without reboots and without bringing things down in a drastic manner. Uh, Keith. Is there any idea of data locality in our center schedule scheduler? Um, so we have that in our Nova scheduler. So I believe at present we're not doing that data locality in Cinder, but we already have that filter for Nova. So it wouldn't be impossible for us to consider that, um, or for someone implementing this to build that into their system. Doing, um, especially if you design your network architecture a certain way, uh, as we have, then you can very easily actually do uh, something similar to host aggregates, but for Cinder scheduling. Uh, can you or, or do you plan to offer any kind of a performance guarantee when you create volumes or, or volumes? Right. So the question is about performance guarantees when you create Cinder volumes. So I actually had a performance slide I, I took out. Uh, maybe I should have put it back in. And as I was saying to the fellow earlier, I, I think that this is pretty quick. The, the way we've designed this uh, has proven to be incredibly performant. Um, SLAs is something that is done by the deployer and user of the service. And so if you're, for instance, um, a public provider or even a private provider to internal tenants, uh, you would provide that SLA to your users and your tenants. And we can, so when you design the system, you can get an idea for how fast it is, and then you would essentially make whatever promises that you need to the tenants. Um, right there, is that right? That's a really good question. So which backend driver do you use in Cinder for this to work, and is this a cloud scaling thing? So cloud scaling uses Cinder, well, really all of OpenStack pretty much out of the box. Um, we do make some various fixes uh, that we roll into our packages, and then and we make sure that those are put in upstream in uh, parallel as we develop it. Uh, presently, we are using a ZFS plugin that is, well, at very present only within our product, but you could equally use this pattern with LVM. You may not get quite the same performance uh, in doing so, but it would work just the same with the pattern I just described. So the LVM would do everything that I just described, maybe not quite as well or as performant, that's all. Yes, back there. So the question is where you provide the uh, snapshot, in-band or out-band. So the way that we do it is because we use uh, ZFS, we can create the snapshots on ZFS, but then we can download. So this, creating a snapshot in ZFS is actually very quick. So we can then, after we create the snapshot, which is an instant, almost instantaneous operation, then we can download that into uh, our S3 Swift cluster. So the, so the copying of, so the copying to S3 would be out, out of band, but the creation of the original snapshot in which that was based on, it would be somewhat in band. It's, um, it's based on extents and it's kind of a copy on write file system that lets you do this. So it's, um, it just starts creating new blocks and um, it's kind of like Git in a, in a way. So. No, 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 no. So the snapshots are not stored in. So the question was, 
if the snapshots are stored in the sender control plane, and they're, they're not, so those snapshots move up into Swift, so they're stored in Swift. And in this architecture, you would not want to put Swift on top of Cinder. <laughs> So you would so you create the snapshots the same way that you create snapshots. So the question is if you create the snapshots in Cinder, and the answer is that you create the snapshots in the same way that you create snapshots with EBS. And we actually, uh, at least we, support the Amazon APIs. So you would use the same tools and commands and API requests that you use in EC2 to get those things into Swift and S3. Um, back there. The question is about Ceph, um, why we're not using it. So I don't want to say anything bad about the design of Ceph or distributed file system. I'm actually a bit of a distributed systems guy myself. Uh, Sage is pretty cool. Um, Amazon appears to be using a distributed system. We are already assuming as I said earlier, that we don't have the reliability, so we could you know, trade against that reliability. I just don't know if it's necessary, so it's a, there's a lot of complexity in doing a distributed uh, file store. And if we're effectively distributing the data just in a different way, in what I think is a much simpler way, so I question in this case if we would really need it. And if you're Another, another thing to be considered is if you use Ceph um, for what we're describing here, you'd have to have two Ceph deployments, one for storing your objects, which are your snapshots, and another for storing your data, because if you don't trust the reliability of your data store, and, and, you, and you can't when you use uh, something, well, I'm gonna say you, you can't use it when you use a distributed data store, if you want consistency, uh, then you need to do the snapshots. So Ceph would have to either be uh, consistent or reliable. And if you can deploy it both ways, then you'd have to have two deployments, one which is one way and one which is the other way. Um, but if they both provide the same level of guarantees and this, uh, then they both, all, all of your Cinder or all of your Ceph sits on one side of Brewer's theorem, then you can't pull all of your data there. You have to have your data stored on uh, both sides. Um, over here. Um, have you tried to use a Moose file system? It's kind of similar to the Google file system. Uh, the Moose file system? Yeah. Uh, we haven't tried to use it. Um, do you, I mean, do you have more specific questions about that? <laughs> Right, so the question is if we have experience with Moose um, as a distributed file system, and also noting that nobody seems to be using it. So we, we, pref so we prefer to use things that are known, well-trusted, and that we know we can make work, and have the least level of risk. And this is what I would consider to be a safe approach, using uh, things that people have used for years and have worked reliably for, with, for people for years. Like there. Okay. Okay. Let's answer the first question first. Um, first question was. Uh, oh yeah. So about the HA. So you're asking uh, if we advocate using HA on these backend systems. So could we essentially do this direct attached thing and then still do HA? And I would say that's when you again start reintroducing split brain problems, and I would advise against it. Now, you, you could do that. 
but I do believe that you start introducing, because uh, you now introduce a consistency problem when you want to have consistent storage. And every time you do HA pairs with storage, you are going to give up consistency. And I think that's a bad idea. And if you're doing the snapshots, then you don't need it. So why introduce the complexity? Then your second question was about what distribution and packages do we use for ZFS on Linux? Or do we use Open Solaris? And the answer to that is that we actually have quite a few people at our office, including myself, who have used Open Solaris um, and derivatives over the years. We, have in, we started with a POC that was based on a Solaris uh, Gen Unix kernel. And we moved off of that. So after we finished our, our uh, proof of concept, we then switched to Linux. And we presently use Ubuntu with uh, ZFS and Linux packages. Over here first. So um, uh, you briefly released uh, Tinder now supports backing up block storage in Swift, which is a snapshot mechanism. Okay. Um, the question is, in Grizzly, there's a snapshot capability uh, into Swift, and, and if we are using that. And I am not certain. So we're actually deploying on Folsom. So I believe that we're doing our own thing to get it into, into there. But to be quite honest, I'm not entirely certain. I, I wasn't uh, the actual engineer that implemented the, the uh, the snapshots, so I'd have to confirm that. Um, I believe there's another question across the aisle earlier. Oh, back there. Yeah. So you, you said you have to have like a distributed system like Ceph, two different implementations. Uh, you know, one for more consistency, one for more uh, availability. I guess is what you're getting at. Right? Um, why couldn't you just use the same one and, and choose at the time you wrote the data how many copies? In other words, all you do is write one. Sure. Right. So the question is, why can't you just have more copies with a distributed file system as opposed to putting snapshots on one side and block storage on the other? And the answer is that if you make multiple copies, then you no longer have consistency, and consistency is really important. <laughs> Right, but if you have multiple copies, how do you have consistency? You, every time you make a write, you update every copy? Or you have older copies and now you no longer have consistency? So the question is, what kind of hardware is underneath of this, uh, SAN, NAS? And so these boxes, the, the actual physical machines are, uh, for us anyway, are machines that are part of our H, uh, HCL. So we are vendor, semi-vendor agnostic. So we work with various vendors, and we certify hardware to work with our software. So. For instance, we support uh, Quanta and Dell hardware. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the full HCL is, but we have an HCL of uh, vendor hardware that we support, and these are x86 boxes with a bunch of disks attached. Oh, over there. Right. So the question is, how do you do recoveries? Um, assuming that if you make snapshots, that you then recover them. And users that deploy on the cloud, if they lose their data or they, they lose their instance, then they, re then they recover from a snapshot. Your, your tenants do that. You just make sure that they have the data available to them to recover from. Back here in the middle again. I'm not, sir, can you repeat that again? Just to follow up on, on the gentleman's question. Sure. Uh, can we, when, once you have a snapshot of a volume, can I then create a new volume from an existing snapshot? 
Yes. So the, yeah, the question is if you can re uh, create a new volume from an existing snapshot, and yes. So the idea is that feature parity with the way that Amazon does things and to support the things that they support, uh, such as that, which is to uh, re recover from a snapshot. Back, back there. Do we plan on releasing our ZFS code at all? Uh, possibly. Uh, m pretty much everything that we do is open source. Um, we do quite a lot of open source development. Uh, uh, Joseph Gordon here in the front and myself are uh, very active uh, core developers and core reviewers, uh, in his case, of OpenStack. And we do contribute a lot of code. I'm not certain when that code will be released, and I believe part of the issue is that we only fairly, re so only in our latest release did we actually port that over from doing the Open Solaris stuff to Linux. So we waited, we wanted to wait until we actually had the Linux based one before we released it because uh, the Open Solaris stuff was something we figured that not only were we not going to use, but probably nobody was going to use. So we didn't want to release that. <laughs> Any other questions? We're almost out of time anyway, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs>